Welcome to all who are sharing in this service, either on Sunday the 27th of June or catching up later on. We would be delighted if you let us know that you're watching this by using the contact details shown on the screen. 
The service is coming from Capel St Mary Methodist Church in Suffolk, where I, Andrew Sankey, am the minister, and also the minister at Holbrook and Chamaldiston. This was to have been the last pre-recorded service before restarting in church, but because of the restrictions have not yet been relaxed, we are continuing for another three weeks, and hopefully on the last Sunday of July, in July, I will lead from in church with the congregation. I wait confirmation. We come today to the last of the Bible Month Sundays, looking at Paul's letter to the Colossians. Doug Barnett shared Paul's teaching on the supremacy of Christ in our first week. Ted Jack helped us understand the, Paul's emphasis on spiritual fullness in Christ. Last week, I focused on the work of transformation from the old life to the new, listing the things we need to put off and the spiritual clothing we are to put on. Today we look at Paul applying what he has been teaching to Christian households and conclude the letter with an emphasis on prayer and standing firm. We will split the reading and the reflection in two and use the basis of the last chapter of this letter as a framework for our prayers of intercession near the end of the service. Our opening songs pick up what Paul has already told us in this letter, that we've moved from the old self to the new. We are, as Paul describes to the Romans, new creations. The transformation has happened in our lives inspires us to praise God. The second song reminds us of the greatness of our God and that he is wonderful. But first we sing, I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God, I stand.
We share three prayers, one of thanksgiving, one recognising God's love is expansive and powerful and cannot be stopped, and a third recognising that we often fail to love with the same love. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are great, you are wonderful, and we want to praise you as we have just sung. There is no limit to your love and to the joy you want us to experience. As we worship, our hearts are overflowing because you have poured out your love into our lives by your Holy Spirit. Father, it is only by your grace that we can stand and experience the fullness of being in Christ. We want to be channels of your love to a broken world. Amen. Love has its source in you, creator God, flows from you like an ocean into a world as unyielding as any shoreline cliff. And like the ocean, which batters, erodes and wears away, even the hardest stone, your love persists, finding cracks and inlets and hardened hearts, flows inside and works a miracle. Who would think that water was more powerful than granite? Love mightier than the hardest heart. Thank you, Creator God, for the power of your love. Amen. You call us to love as you love. Care as you care. Seek justice, mercy and truth. And a world that has yet to feel the warmth of your embrace. But we fail to heed your call. We draw back from those in need. Say nothing when we see injustice. Become invisible. Forgive us. You whose love is better than life. You whose grace extends to all. Forgive us and enable us to be the people we could be. That your name might be on the lips of all people. Amen. I've split the reading today into two parts. Melissa will read the first part and then I'll have a short reflection. Later Margaret will read the second half and complete our reading of Colossians and I will share a further reflection and then lead into our intercessions. A reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 3 beginning at verse 17. Instructions for Christian Households And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, 
because you know that you will also have a master in heaven. We begin where we finished last week, with Paul reminding the Colossians and us that our commitment to Jesus is to be worked out in our daily lives. It is whole life discipleship, in the home and in the workplace. Paul writes in verse 17, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The verse is echoed a little bit later in verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not human masters. We so often put our lives in two segments, the spiritual and the secular. Paul is saying all the things we do and say and think are done in the presence of Jesus with us. And he illustrates that with the relationships in the home and in the workplace. This is one of those places where we have to acknowledge that the social conditions assumed in the passage are not exactly the same social conditions most of us face today. However, this does not mean the passage is of no use to us, providing we are careful to recognise the principles which flow from it, which are applicable now as much then. In these days, with equality of sexes, one submitting to the other does not sit comfortably with us. We prefer the context to this instruction that Paul gave to the Ephesians. Chapter 5, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Despite the fact that we may feel uncomfortable with Paul's words, I'm grateful to Paul about being so blunt to men. In Colossians, husband, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I want to protest to Paul and say, of course I love my wife. You don't need to tell me to love her. I made that commitment to love my wife in front of a hundred people 47 years ago. They are my witnesses. Paul then adds those extra words and do not be harsh with them. And I'm brought up short. Just moments ago, my wife came in and interrupted my writing of this message and I was, to say the least, less than gracious. A little irritated might be more, uh, is more right, and perhaps the word harsh is an even better description. And I confess it's not the first time, if not daily or even repeatedly several times a day, it's many more times that I've been harsh than I have said to my wife, I love you. Paul's addition of those words, do not be harsh, speaks into my heart, and I'm still a work in progress of becoming a loving husband. And if you read Paul's words to husbands in Ephesians, it's even more unsettling. There he writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives, writes Paul. Wow, we are to love as Jesus loves us and lay down his life for us. If I always had the best interests of my wife and was willing to make any sacrifice, life would be a lot different in our household. If I have the words of criticism of my wife, I'm really criticising myself, for these words of Paul say, I am to present her without stain, wrinkle or any other blemish. There's still more transformation required in me. Paul goes on to talk about the reciprocity of these relationships, wife and husband, children and parents, between slaves and masters. There'll be some of you listening who are not married or no longer married or don't have children, or don't have a paid job, or any reason why you might exclude yourself from what Paul says. But not too quick. It's about relationships and whole life. Following Christ embraces the whole of our lives, wherever we find ourselves on a daily basis, living out our faith in the midst of specific relationships and specific duties. Our Christian faith rooted in these specific places with specific people 
and specific tasks in everyday life. In the first century context, much of what Paul says is countercultural. He calls wives to submit to their husbands. That probably wouldn't raise many eyebrows. But what he says to the husband would have sounded out of kilter with society and culture at the time. Slaves too are treated as members of the community, and the fact that they are addressed at all is significant. They share in a common responsibility of the community of faith and wider society. Our working for Christ requires us to be in relationship with others, not just in the church and not just on Sundays, but in the home and at work, on Mondays to Saturdays. This is passage is not just about how to have a better marriage or to raise better kids or to be a better worker. It's about demonstrating to society that there is a way out of the mess. We tend to make as human beings and it's as though Jesus Christ, who restores life and reorders relationships. Paul is not trying to give a detailed advice. Instead, he gets us to think about our current role in relation to Christ and to see how Christ redefines our role, whether we are husbands, wives, parents, children, employers or employees, or some combination of these things. Children were technically the property of their father, and they were in fact no better off than a slave. So it's unsurprising that the exhortation to children is the same as the exhortation to slaves, except that the obedience is called in relation to both parents. The equivalent exhortation to fathers is simply that they should not provoke their children. So a surprisingly negative summary of paternal responsibility. It is also noteworthy that slaves are directly addressed, the assumption being that the household slaves will be in the congregation addressed by Paul. The word used for their masters is the same as that used for Christ, hence the qualification, your earthly masters. Their responsibility to earthly masters does not distract from their loyalty to Christ. They are to perform their role wholeheartedly, including when no one is watching them. Their motivation that they are doing it for the Lord. Their primary relation is not with masters, but with the Lord. And they can be assured that they are his heirs. Under Roman law, slaves could not inherit anything. So Paul's reassurance was a reminder of their higher status in God's eyes. The assurance of God's impartiality. Wrongdoers, whatever their status, will be paid back for the wrongs they have done. It must have been tremendously reassuring in a society where as many as 50% of the people were slaves. Also note the final counsel to masters, in effect reminding them that they too have obligations to their slaves. They were not merely chattels to be disposed of at the owner, as the owners chose, but should be treated justly and fairly. Even or especially hard-nosed masters should remember that before God, they, they too were but slaves. The bar is set very high. All of us fail to live at this quality of relationship. But we have an amazing God who doesn't want us to wallow in our failure and have no hope. He offers forgiveness when we are honest with ourselves and with him. Before we move on, we sing a Stuart Townend song which admits our sinfulness, asks for forgiveness and invites God to continue changing us till our lives reflect his heart. After we've sung, Margaret will read the second part of our reading. But first we sing, Father, we have sinned in word and deed and thought. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
A reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. Further instructions and final greetings. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, See that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. We come to the concluding part of Paul's letter. Paul has given attention to the faith of the church, indicating that he both thanks God for it and prays for it. He includes a hymn of praise of Christ and applies it to his readers. He deals with some of the issues at stake in the church. And the second half of the letter is a practical application contrasting the old lifestyle and the new lifestyle in Christ. Things to be put off and qualities to put on for whole life discipleship. And he gives some specific instructions for certain groups of people. And so he draws to a close with this letter with some further instructions which are important. And then he shares greetings from all sorts of different people on his contact list. And we can even learn something from that, from the breadth of his contact list. The first part of Colossians is Paul reflecting on what the Bible says elsewhere that godly walk goes hand in hand with godly talk. And here he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim it the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Paul encourages the Colossians to look outwards, to pray for his evangelistic work, and to be alert to their own opportunities in word, 
and deed to proclaim the mystery of Christ. The word proclaim is repeated twice in this passage, in verse 3 and verse 4. Paul also asked for prayer that he and the apostle, other apostles would be able to proclaim what he calls the mystery of Christ clearly. But his own proclamation of Christ appears to be the pattern of the way the Colossians are also to proclaim Christ. Paul wants the prayer to be watchful and thankful. Watchful in the sense of seeing those opportunities of God already at work in people's lives and thus being available for people. And watchful also in recognising the temptations that could draw us or those who are seeking to reach Christ away from him. Last week we heard that some of the Colossians were being deceived by empty philosophy. Thankful that God has not abandoned them and is giving them opportunities for outreach, Paul also recognises that nothing really happens apart from God. Pray that God may open a door. Then Paul goes on to encourage them to act wisely. And notice this happens after prayer. We often do it the wrong way around. We hear an appeal, send money or send a team, but haven't yet prayed. We need to pray particularly for wisdom as to how to act when the opportunities present themselves to us each day. When I don't specifically pray for the eyes to see the opportunity, I often only realise too late that I've missed the opportunity or even don't see it at all. The final section of his letter is a goodbye section, but in it is included a fourth way to get involved in the mission. We've had prayer, we've had action, we've had speaking. Now he affirms that we are to stand firm in the faith. Bubble and squeak is a traditional way of making a further meal out of leftovers after a roast distant dinner, perhaps particularly at Christmas time, and is often much appreciated. You could imagine these final 12 verses of Paul's letter to the Colossians as bubble and squeak. There are lots and pieces of pieces left over from the letter that are just lumped together before he runs out of paper. We've had an ordered meal with the main points, but now there's a mishmash of different bits pushed together. There are bits of news about the 11 people who are named specifically and the two groups of people and the farewells and thanks. But in it, Paul is pressing home several points that he has made earlier in his letter. But there's only time now to pick out two of those uh, as we draw to a close. Paul first refers to Tychius and Epaphras. Tychius is a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. He was the courier of the letter of, of, uh, to the Colossians from Paul. Epaphras was, was from Colossae and did the church planting uh, there. Paul hadn't been involved in that church plant. Uh, Epaphras was the one who had done it, one of their own people. Epaphras was one of the Colossians and again a servant of Jesus whom Paul describes as wrestling in prayer for his fellow townsfolk. Paul is wanting the Colossian Christians to remember those who serve him. Tychias to encourage their hearts in verse 2 and as he gives and as he gives news of Paul imprisoned but in good spirits as chains do not stop the proclamation of the gospel. Epaphras's prayer is that Colossians may stand firm in the will of God, that they may become mature and fully assured. So as Paul shares their greetings, he reminds them to remember those who serve and to stand firm and to grow in maturity for their sakes, so that their work was not in vain. Secondly, Paul brings greetings from Aristarchus. He was a fellow prisoner with Paul and several times in the passage and in the letter he has indicated that he is in chains. He is a prisoner for proclaiming the gospel. He is suffering yet he's not a moaner or a complainer. Paul sees the opportunity it gives him to proclaim the gospel. But again a secondary message is coming through as he shares these greetings from people who are experiencing suffering. 
faith in Jesus doesn't necessarily mean no suffering. And they are saying, stand firm, even in your suffering. So with a reminder to pray, to take action and to speak, and now to stand firm and to remember those who serve us, and to stand firm even in suffering, we draw a close to the letter of Paul to the Colossians. And I close by reading one of the key verses of the letter from week two of our series. Paul says in chapter two and verse six, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Only Jesus is worth entrusting your life to. Only Jesus is worth living for. Only Jesus is worth telling other people about. In Christ, we have everything. And so live for him. Our intercessions are based upon this last chapter of Paul to the Colossians uh, and also picking up some other verses from the whole letter. I begin with some verses from chapter 2. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ we have been brought to fullness. He is ahead over every power and authority. Filled full of Jesus, we come to you with our prayers. Father, we pray with watchfulness, watchful of ourselves, that we do not fall into temptation, watchful that we are gracious in our dealings with others, watchful of our tendency to be selfish and independent. Father, we pray with thankfulness, thankful for Jesus, your Son, who made our salvation possible. Thank you for the community of faith that encourages us. Thank you for your peace in our hearts. Thankful for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thankful for your servant, Paul, who has made so much clear to us. Father, we pray for others, for those who don't know Jesus in our community and our families, for those recently bereaved and for funerals taking place this month. 
for those who are in dire financial problems, for those in hurting, broken relationships, for children living with tension in the home circumstances. Father, we pray that we may recognise our dependence on you, that we would commit our daily walk to walking with you, and that we acknowledge that you open doors into people's lives through prayer, that you are the one who offers salvation. Father, we pray for those who are evangelists proclaiming the gospel. We pray that Christ will be proclaimed clearly. We pray for the, the work of Wycliffe and the Bible societies, making the good news of the Bible accessible in people's own language. We pray for people from this church that are serving the gospel. We think particularly of Matt Finch and Ben Horrocks and many others who've grown through this church and are serving in all sorts of different places. Father, we pray for those who are making Jesus known through practical acts of caring. For those working with hands at work, particularly Tommy and Morgan. For the Leprosy Mission. For Tear Fund. Father, we pray that we may act wisely towards other people. Open our eyes to the opportunities that you present us. Transform our hearts to reflect your heart for people. Pray that we may use the resources you have blessed us with. Pray that our gifts may reach the people you have entrusted to our care. Father, we pray that you would watch over our tongue, our speech, that our speech may be civil, polite, gentle, and inoffensive, that we would use words to build rapport with people, that we would be ready with answers to those curious about our faith. We pray that we may be sensitive to the prompting of your Holy Spirit. We pray for flavours and words to flow from our mouths. Father, we pray for those who have shared the gospel with us. We thank you for their witness to Jesus that helped us discover you. We pray your protection upon them. We pray that we, in our turn, may play our part in making Jesus known to others. Father, we pray for those who share in your sufferings, for the work of the Barnabas Fund, for the work of Release International, for the work of Open Door. May we stand firm with persecuted believers. Thank you, Father, that you hear our prayer. Thank you for the scriptures that inspire and broaden our praying. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Thank you to all who have joined us today and taken part, uh, and, and also those who have taken part in this service. Next week at 10.30 a.m. online, we will start a new series for the month of July entitled The Man Who Won't Go Away. Jim Ross will be speaking and has been given the title Jesus for Skeptics. The 9.30 reflection time in the church will continue for three more Sundays. And then on July the 25th, we hope to run the 10.30 service live streaming service with a congregation in church. But for today, we close with Charles Wesley's great hymn, Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open the door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And so may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and for all eternity. Amen.
My home.